Good morning or good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Let me know if you could. You can hear me loud and clear. I just realized that I had uh, my mic muted. Okay, good. Hey, Kevin. Hello again. Long time no see. <laughs> Been a while, huh? Shut this phone off so it doesn't keep going off. Good morning, Helen. <laughs> How's the market treating you this morning is the big question. Hopefully good, but it's a crazy market. It's really mixed. I mean, it's which it's the way it's been for a long time, it seems like. The last month, month and a half, it's sideways. You made a donation. That charity is always a good thing. <laughs> Guess it depends on who it's going to, right? Uh, hopefully, I'll keep this cough at bay. It's it's better, but it's still lingering. So, as long as you were willing to make the donation and you knew that uh, there could have been an in kind donation that was three times bigger than the do donation you made, you're golden, right? <laughs> going back to last night. Anyway, welcome out to Training Coaches Playbook for those of you that are maybe new here. I see a lot of familiar names and some that I haven't seen. So if we haven't met, my name is Tony Benson, and uh, I will be your pattern whisperer today. Um, so let me get to the disclaimer out of the way. I'm not a registered broker deal investment advisor. I'm not going to give you any recommendations or advice. Everything we do here is purely for educational purposes. If I do happen to mention a trade, just assume it is a paper trade or a practice trade. For regulatory reasons, we do not discuss funded trading. But the market is open, so it can make it kind of fun. So but here's what's coming up. Just cover everything. Uh, Inner Circle is tomorrow morning, bright and early. Uh, is there anybody in here that is in Inner Circle? I didn't know if, uh, I don't know who's in there. I haven't done it, but uh, I'm going to be there in the morning. So if you're in the Inner Circle, then uh, we'll see you then. So um, basically just kind of filling in for, for Rob for a little bit. So I'm kind of excited about it. I don't, I haven't been in one. I don't even know what they do there exactly. So I'm just going to go in and wing it and have some have a good time. So if you're part of that group, then we'll see you in the morning. Um, so Mastermind Group, uh, May 2nd. Uh, trading You, uh, May 3rd. We just did that last night. I did that. I know I rotate with, I don't know if anybody else besides me, Rob and I do it, but um, I do once a month, I think. So, um, and it's always fun. I love doing this. It's, it's This is fun for me. So, and if you just sit behind the computer and trade all day, which I have other things going on, but you know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> life gets kind of boring when you don't get out of the house much. So, uh, or talk to anybody, right? So trading can get lonely if all you do is sit behind the computer and trade all day. So I enjoy, I enjoy teaching. I think I got that from my mom. She was a, she was a teacher for 28 years. So uh, Mastery and Trade is May 8th. Uh, Vegas Spread Mastery, May 9th. And then uh, Power Options Place, because Tuesdays and Saturdays, Covered Call Explorers on Thursdays. Power Hour, uh, Mondays at noon. Trading Coaches Playbook, this one, every Friday at noon. <clears throat> and then uh, Patterns Today with yours truly is going to be May 9th and May 10th. So come out and join me there, <clears throat> and uh, we'll have some fun there. I always try to have fun. So I talk, <laughs> I talk to myself all the time. Talk about, you have to talk to yourself when there's nobody else around, right? <clears throat> I was on a web shop the other day. I had a meeting with some other people, and I didn't realize I didn't mute it. I started the web shop and then I walked off and I was just talking to myself. And I come back, I was like, well, I hope they didn't hear me because <laughs> I wasn't muted. <laughs> Technology, it's great, but then sometimes it uh, can get you in trouble, right? What just happened? Okay. That was weird. There we go. I don't know what happened there. All right. I know now y'all think I'm crazy. He's talking to himself all the time. But you know what they say? Geniuses talk to themselves. <laughs> if that's the case, I'm Einstein. I got his picture behind me. The cat's not here, though. I mean, she may join us. But you can find us all on social media. So if we have a met, I mean, I, like I say, I see a lot of familiar names here. But uh, I got to have my coffee. Right, especially this morning. It's still I'm on the West Coast, right? I'm out in the Seattle area. So it's only nine o'clock out here. So I'm on only on cup number three. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you think I have Einstein? <laughs> I have Einstein's picture behind me. <laughs> I found my 
anyway um get the cat out i don't know where she's at so and i don't chase her down but she is fixed you won't hear her growling anymore um i just got her a little for those of you that are maybe doing like what are you talking about a cat for i got a cat a few months ago this lady gave her to me she wanted to get rid of her so i wasn't planning on it but she was in heat and she's running around here growling in the middle of a workshop she's just growling really loud and it was kind of obnoxious but also i felt bad for her because so but she's fixed now and she's fine so but patterns of flash is uh, a tool i created for technical analysis if you want to learn how to read charts better <clears throat> not only recognize the patterns but how to trade them uh weekly whispers we launched uh, the first part of this year which is basically just me putting my analysis and all my trading candidates for the week um on a video and uploading it so you can go see, I usually have 20 to 30 candidates every single week. I go through it and here's my analysis. Here's the pattern I see, or sometimes it's just, it looks like a decent trade. And uh, so I usually, I've been trying to get those to about 45 minutes, but they always run about an hour. So I uh, I find squirrels now and then. Small accounts, big return. That's another one I did a while back that was recorded. You can watch. So if you're working with a smaller account, um, this is one thing that you may want to look into and see some different strategies and way to deal with a smaller account. In rea reality, you, you should be trading your account no matter what size it is the same way, right? A $1,000 account, a $100,000 account. The only thing that's different is how many zeros are in it. But the process of trading and how you go about it and how you enter and exit trades is it should be exactly the same. There's going to be minor variations with a smaller account. Obviously, you can't, you know, I have a 10% rule, which I'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, I don't put any more than 10% of my account in any one trade. If you got a thousand dollar account, that's a lot more difficult to do, right? You got to find options that are only trading for a dollar, which can be done. It's possible. It's just more difficult. So you might need to change that rule a little bit when you're starting until you get to a bigger account. But realistically, if you got a $10,000 account or a million dollar account, you should be trading those the same. You got a $10,000 account, you shouldn't be putting more than a thousand dollars into a trade. You got a million dollar account, you shouldn't put more than 100,000. Realistically, you probably shouldn't put more than 50,000. You should actually scale that rule down as you get bigger. So, but it depends on your risk tolerance. Everybody's different, right? Some people like to take a lot of risk and other people are a little more skittish, right? So you got to figure out where you're at. And that's one of the things we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, but Patterns Today is a new one we're doing uh, next, yeah, it's next month. I think it's, well, it was the ninth, ninth and 10th, I think. I don't know. I'm a typical guy. I don't plan ahead. And I mean, I put things on my calendar, but I don't think about it until, okay, it's the day before. Oh, it's Christmas Eve. I guess I should go shopping. <laughs> That's me. Um, so anyway, but we'll have some fun there. So here's what we're going to talk about today, though. Do you use a discretionary system or a non-discretionary system? And what's the difference, right? And is one better than the other? Potato, potato, right? Depends on who you talk to. Some people say one's better. Others say the other's better. A non-discretionary system is based solely on objective data, right? Essentially, and with the computing power we have today, it's actually relatively easy, especially if you're a nerd. If you're a full nerd, piece of cake. If you're mathematical, piece of cake. Because... Most charts, even Omega charts, has the ability to create your own little system. And you can even go, I think with the right version of it, you can go back test it too. I haven't really played with it much. I have a little bit, but not a ton. Um, <clears throat> but you're basically just taking objective data, plugging it into the system and saying, if this happens, then it's a buy signal. And if this happens, it's a sell signal. Moving an average cross, you probably all heard of that, right? Moving average cross system. So you create two moving averages, You know, the maybe the 10 and the 20 or the 20 and the 50, or the 50 and the 200, whatever it is, depending on your, your, your time frame, right? <laughs> and if the faster moving average crosses up through the slower moving average, then you buy, right? And if it crosses down, then you sell. That's a really simple, very basic system. And it's non-discretionary. In other words, you don't make a decision. You put the data in, and you can even automate a lot of this, even in, in a lot of computing systems now. You can just have it fully autopilot. Say, okay, here's the stock, Amazon stock. If the 10 day crosses the 20 day going up, then buy the stock. And as soon as those prices collide, it triggers an order and says, buy, buy Amazon. 
whatever the price is. And then the opposite, if it's obviously crossing down, then sell Amazon. So you don't make a decision. The system does it for you, right? Mean reversion is another one that is discretionary, right? Where it's basically, here's one I, I saw recently was uh, somebody used the Bollinger Band. Say so if it closes, if the stock closes three bars into the Bollinger Band, I think it was a daily, right? And that's going to modify. But you could use the same thing on intraday or whatever the time frame. it doesn't really matter. But three closes into the Bollinger Bands, either up or down, you take a position, right? If it's, if it's dropping off, if it's dropped down and gone into the Bollinger Bands three times, if it's closed into the bands three times, you go long. And then if it hits the upper band is when you sell. And the opposite the other way, right? If it's going up and it's got three closes into the bands, you sell it short and then close it when it hits the bottom of the band. So you can create systems like that that say, okay, because obviously the Bollinger Band data is on the chart and it says, here's where it's at. It'll show you exactly what the price point's at. So you could build it in and say, if it hits that band, then short the stock. And then if it hits this band, buy it back. So you can create a completely automated system that way. It's non-discretionary. It just says, if this happens, then do this. You don't make decisions, right? Now, patterns I've got in there as a partial non-discretionary because it's they're partial to well as you see the next section discretionary is based on subjective it's also in there because patterns are partially discretionary and partially non-discretionary right there are certain criteria and certain things we look for in patterns and they have to have a certain look to them to the for the most part right you can't i mean a head and shoulders is a head and shoulders the pattern itself is there and there are some criteria that we look for with regards to volume and what the pattern looks like but there's also some variances, right? There, no two are, are ever alike, and they're rarely perfect. So patterns kind of have a mix, right? And in reality, when it comes down to creating your own trading system, essentially, which is kind of what you need to do, right? Because it's all based on your trading style, how much money you're working with, what your risk tolerance is, where you're at mentally and emotionally with regard to trading. Those are all factors you've got to figure out individually. Right. I can give you rules and guidelines and I can teach you what these different pieces are. There you go, Brenda. Um, but you've really got to create something that makes it your own. Right. So she hit the mouse. Now that is a problem. <laughs> okay. What just happened here? Okay. She's trying to help. That's the only thing I don't like about her when she interrupts me. <laughs> Cats and mice. Actually, that was part of the reason I got her. Uh, even though I don't have a mouse problem, but I have found a couple of huge dead rats in my backyard last summer and the summer before. So um, just one, just twice. But it was like, you know what? I guess a cat would be good for that to keep, to keep varmints out, even though I don't have a problem with it. But that wasn't a good reason. That was just an excuse, I think, to justify getting her. <laughs> you ever make excuses and justify staying in the trade or do something that maybe you shouldn't do or you didn't want to do? <laughs> okay. It applies to everything in life, right? <laughs> but I mean, Maine Coons are, it, it, she's a Maine Coon. This lady was selling her house. She'd sold the other two. This was the third last kitten and she just wanted to get rid of her. So she, you could have her for nothing. And so I hemmed and hawed for a couple of days and then I touched base with her and she said, yeah, she's, she's still here. If you want her, come get her. I was like, all right. And so um, I didn't plan on it. I'd get a dog, but I don't have enough time for a dog. So, and she's part dog anyway. She plays fetch. She'll come drop something on my desk and then I'll throw it and she'll bring it back. <laughs> it's crazy. So, but anyway. Um, yeah, I haven't, I, I remember a while back, Amelia talking about that. Generous Amelia used moving average to get out of the trade. So, yeah, and that's, it. well, there's the beauty is you can create whatever system you want for whatever works for you. Some of you might be doing spreads. I know Amelia does a lot of spread trading, um, or at least she used to. Last time I, I talked to her specifically about trading stuff, um, she was doing a lot of spreads. But um, and if you do spreads, you know, you're probably going to create a little bit different system than maybe what I use. So I'm basically, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving you a big overview and then essentially showing you how I trade. So, and this is what you'll see. If you have weekly whispers, if you're not in there yet, then you'll see that. 
um, you'll see exactly what I do in there. And we'll have a we should have a little time. It's uh, what time is it? I always forget that that's right there. Um, so going on to news is discretionary, right? Some people trade the news, which is obviously discretionary. So it's subjective, right? You got to try to determine what the news is and how it's going to affect things. Um, in fact, where's Amazon? Just curious. I didn't even. Oh, they're only down four bucks. That's not bad. Uh, support and resistance. That's a subjective thing, right? There is no right or wrong answer to drawing support or resistance. I mean, there are some guidelines, some rules, some basic um, guidelines, I guess. So that's something that is subjective, though. It's not, there's no right or wrong to that. So what is critical, I think, in, in my opinion, is to create, like, I think I said this already. I've been in this repeat mode for some reason. Create the system that works for you. I've been at this 23 years. I've been teaching for 12 or 13. And people are always looking for an exact answer. Right? How do I do? What, what do you do? How do I do? I want to copy what you're doing. Well, you can't really because we're not the same people, right? We have different backgrounds. You have all these. It's just, it's just not really realistic. So my focus has always been on teaching concepts and this kind of, you know, big picture perspective and saying, here's some guidelines to trade, but you've really got to adapt and adjust to what your style is. So, because I really don't like spreads that much. Some people love them. I know a guy that, gosh, it was Tahari, I think it's Tahari. It was a guy from Nigeria or something like that. I met him probably 15 years ago and he loved spreads. And he killed it making spreads. I mean, this is a guy that barely spoke English and had no education. He grew up in somewhere in Africa. Uh, um, no, Ethiopia. He was from Ethiopia. And he came to the States. He was working for an airline. He used to fly around to different workshops once a month. I think Rob was his instructor, actually. He, he, he loved Rob, so he followed Rob wherever once a month because he could go, he could fly for free, right? So he'd fly into a city. He'd rent a car, he'd fly in the morning of the workshop because he paid for the original one. He saved those money to pay for the, the original workshop. And then he got to go back for free. So he'd hop on a, a plane the morning of, he'd get there usually a little bit late, but he'd rent a car. He'd sleep in the car that night because he didn't want to pay for a hotel because he didn't have a lot of money. And he'd stay for the workshop, then he'd go back to the airport. And sometimes he'd stay the night at the airport until the next morning if he couldn't hop on a plane the next, you know, that night. So, and he did that like once a month. And he spent a year working hard and figuring out what worked best for him. And then he, he took what little he had in his, he had some retirement account, I think he said. I don't know if he set up his own, but he started trading in that. And he turned, I think it was 1000 or $5,000 in four years into a half a million bucks. Just do, he just did spreads. It was crazy. I'm sitting there listening to him telling me the story. I'm just in my mind. I'm going, I mean, that, it's an awesome story. And he had apparently told, so he had four or five siblings and he said something to him and his mom was, was, had some health issues. So he moved in with his mom. He paid off her house. He took his funds that he made. He paid off her house and then he moved in with her so he could take care of her. He, because all of his siblings were like, there's no way you did this. So he just gave them all 10 grand. <laughs> just to prove them wrong. It's like, here, here's $10,000. So it was like 40 or 50 grand he gave to them. I think he kept five or 10 or 20 grand for himself and he gave the rest to his church. And then he started trading again. He didn't have any bills. So he just did what he did again. And I mean, I lost track of him. I don't know where he's at, but um, that's the beauty of the market. It's the great equalizer. Doesn't care where you're from. Doesn't care what your education is. Doesn't care what language you speak. None of that matters. The market only cares about skill level. That's it. That's what I love about it. I, I don't care where you're from. And not to go too far, I'll keep uh, one more quick story. We were in Chicago. This is a this is the vast difference between Tafari and I can't remember this other gentleman's name. He came to the two-day workshop. He waited till the very end when everybody else was gone. He comes to the back of the table, throws a credit card down. He says, give me everything. It's like 25, 30 grand. Right? For the software and all the all the everything that was there, 
and they got to chat with him, picking his brain a little bit. And he said, basically, he said, I'm worth eight figures. I made all my money in real estate. I've always wanted to get into the market and trading and investing, but I've just never had time. He was, I've, you know, rearranged my life a little bit. And now I have some time and effort and energy and I want to learn how to do this. He said, I have three PhDs. He, he was worth eight figures, which is 10 million, right? And he had this massive financial background. And then he said, you know, I came in here because he went to a little free thing. Now he comes to the two-day workshop. He said, I came in here with my financial background, my education, and all the things that I know, thinking that I would pick up this information and just run with it and be off to the races. And he said, my head is spinning. He said, I'm so confused. I don't know which way is which. He said, but like everything else I've done in my life, I'll sit down and I'll go through it and I'll study it and I'll work at it and I'll figure it out and I'll get it. So at least he was humble enough to recognize that, but he was also humble enough to acknowledge that he was utterly confused. So you've got one guy that has no education, very little money, almost no money, and starts off and absolutely kills it. This guy comes in, I don't know how he ever did, but he comes in with the opposite, tons of money and tons of education and tons of life experience in the financial arena, at least with real estate, and he's completely confused. So it's, um, it's just proof that this is not easy until you learn it, right? Trading is, there's a lot to learn, but the mechanical stuff is relatively simple, right? Learning to read the charts and see the patterns, <clears throat> those are things you can do. Learning to manage your emotions and make good decisions based on the subjective discretionary part of your trading system, that's a different ballgame. That's the part of trading that's difficult. It's the emotional side of trading. And I've seen lately people, and, and people are all over the board, but most people will say that have been doing this for a long time, that 60 to 70% of trading success comes from learning to manage your emotions from the emotional side. Because learning the option strategies and how they move and how they do this, which option to buy and sell, that stuff's fairly mechanical, right? It's not non-discretionary. It's data oriented. It's, it's objective. It's the subjective part of trading that makes it difficult. Right. And fear is the big driver that drives all of us. I don't care who you are, or how long you've been doing it. It's still there. I've been doing this 23 years and it still affects me. I still make stupid decisions based on fear. And I look back, I'm like, ah, I don't do very often anymore. Was that, that was you, I think last night, Kevin, talking about panicking or was that somebody else? Maybe that was Scott. Because in trade you last night, we were talking about um, panicking, you know, emotions taking over and panicking. And I think it was it was either Scott or Kevin said something about, yeah, I panicked in the trade, right? It takes off and starts running. You think you're going to miss it. Oh, that was you. Okay. Um, you know, it starts moving and you're like, oh, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss it. And then you jump on. And as soon as you get in, boom, it goes the other way. And so one of the things, and I don't, maybe I'm ahead of myself. Yeah, I am. Um, <clears throat> so I'll get there in a minute, but. You'll want to figure out. <clears throat> what part of your trading system should be discretionary and non-discretionary, right? Patterns, there are objective pieces of patterns. We'll get to the charts here in a minute. Yeah, we got lots of time. Um, position sizing, that's one thing. I have a 10% rule, right? I won't put any more than 10% of my account into any one trade. I mean, you bend it sometimes a little bit, yes. But that is a, pretty much a hard and fast rule that I don't break, but on a rare occasion. And it's got to be a pretty compelling reason for me to break it. Usually I stay well under 10%. <clears throat> I don't even, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I typically don't even get to that place. So um, the trade entry, my entry point is completely objective. It's non-discretionary. There is no decision making when it comes to that. Now you go down to the next section, the discretionary parts, patterns, right? You subjectively analyze, analyze a pattern. You can see a pattern and recognize it, but then there's also pieces that you go, okay, this part makes it stronger, this part makes it weaker. There's uh, volume analysis like a head and shoulders, right? You'll have, typically you'll have a, a traditional perfect textbook pattern. You have solid volume going into the left shoulder, lighter volume going to the head, and even lighter volume on the right shoulder. So if you have that set up with the head and shoulders, that makes that particular pattern stronger. So now you can say, okay, here's some subjective analysis but that makes this particular pattern stronger. But the pattern itself has to be there, right? That's non-discretionary. Stops and targets are discretionary. Those are subjective. Where do you put your stop? 
That's usually the number one question that comes out of people, especially when you're starting. Where do you put your stop? And you've got to just kind of play with that yourself and figure it out. Um, I mean, I use support and resistance or trend lines. Most of the time it's support and resistance. You say, okay, if it gets, if it's breaking out, because I'm trading breakouts for the most part. If it breaks below a level and I enter the trade, but then it turns around and goes back above that support or resistance level, then somewhere on the other side of that, depending on how volatile the stock is, is where I'll put my stop. So I just look at the individual chart and say, okay, this thing, it broke below 20. It's possibly headed to 15. And 20 was a support level. And this sucker's volatile, so it jumps from 20 to 22. So I might have to put my stop all the way back at you know, 22.10, 22.15. If it's not super volatile and you know it jumps up to 20 and a half, then I might put my stop at 20.75. So it, it, it is individual on the stock and how volatile it is. So you've got to learn to basically just figure that out. It's really not super complicated, but. Uh, and then position sizing. I have a rule, a hard and fast rule that says no more than 10%, but I scale into and out of trades often. If you're not familiar with scaling, it's basically just getting in or out in chunks, right? If I go whole hog, if something looks really good and I'm buying 10 or 20 or 30 contracts out of the gates, which I don't do that often anymore, then I might get out of, let's just say I have 10, right? I might peel two or three of them back if the stock runs in my direction. I might even, if it starts to look like it's going to reverse, <clears throat> maybe it moves in my favor a little bit and then it gives some kind of indication. Maybe it throws a doji, maybe it, uh, maybe it has a little hammer type of pattern. Something that pops up and says, you know what? I'm not that confident in this thing moving anymore. I think it might go back the other direction. I might pull half of it out for that reason, even at break even or a small loss. And that way I'm reducing my risk on the rest of it. I'll still give it an opportunity to continue to, to, to play out to see if it does. But scaling is getting in or out in chunks. And it will work absolute wonders for emotional control if you haven't done it. That's what we talked about in trade you last night, risk reward and scaling. And the, the, the massive change that it will do to your trading if you implement those two things. Those are the two, probably the two biggest things that completely changed the direction of my trading. I went from doing okay to, okay, now, not only am I doing okay, I'm in a place, I said this last night, I haven't panicked. I can't remember the last time I panicked on a trade, right? If you've been trading more than a couple of days, you know what I mean, right? Where either panicking in or panicking out. So I've gotten to a place where emotionally, most of my decisions are non-emotional. I mean, the emotions are there, but I have systems in place to manage them, right? And that's the next thing is how to improve your system. Because in reality, you're going to have some pieces of each. You're going to have some non-discretionary, some discretionary, right? Distinguish between the two systems. Which parts of your system and how you trade are the hard and fast rules that, okay, here's the way it works. Like my entry, right? A stop is, discre is, is discretionary. It's subjective. You put it where you think. If it goes beyond here, I don't want to be there anymore. The target is also subjective. I right? say, okay, if, if the stock does X, Y, and Z, I think it's going to go to this level. So those two pieces are subjective. Once <clears throat> the entry point is objective, because once I figure out the stop on the target, now it's just math. I'm using three to, three to one risk reward. In other words, I have three times as much upside as I do downside. So all I do is plug in two numbers. Calculator spits out a number that says, here's your entry point based on these two numbers that give you a three to one risk reward. So out of the trading plan that I create, two pieces are discretionary. One piece, absolutely static. It's objective. It's just based on math. So take break down your system of what you're using and how you're trading. Okay, here's the parts that are hard and fast. Here's the parts that are not. I think just that simple breaking the two up into separate pieces can open up your eye and go, okay, wait a minute, this stuff I need to do. And non-discretionary is simple, right? It's just data. It's just, that's why the, 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 the entry point is easy. It's just math, right? You just punch it in. Or now I figured out that on the chart, I can just draw the lines and it does it for me. <laughs> I love it. it. Saves me like 20 to 30 minutes every time I go do my analysis. Um, that fourth bullet point there, 
Discretion obviously involves decision making, which adds the emotional part. One of the most important things you can do is learn to recognize your emotions. And then put a system in place to counteract your emotions. I remember 10, 15 years ago, there's a trader said, I if if a stock breaks my support level or it hits my stop, and I feel myself panicking and freaking out because nobody wa wants to take a loss, right? But if I feel myself <clears throat> freaking out, I take a 10 minute break. Literally get up, leave 10 minutes. I set a timer, I walk away for 10 minutes. And then I come back, go clear my head, do whatever I have to do. And then I come back and see where things are at. You see, if, you, <laughs> if you've ever panicked out of a trade or into a trade, it seems like every single time you do that, it automatically turns around and goes the opposite direction, right? So use your emotions as an indicator. We use indicators on charts, right? I don't use much except for price. Price and volume is 98% of my decision. But if you learn to recognize those emotions you have and you put systems in place, say, okay, well, if you're panicking, Stokes is crashing, right? Whatever you want to call it, however you need to figure it out in your head. If an indicator is doing a certain thing, then you do X, Y, and Z. If your emotions are now indicators, then when your emotions do X, Y, and Z, then you do this to counteract it. Don't panic. Walk away for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you got to do. Does that make sense, hopefully? Want to go play? Why is Tesla still going on? Stupid thing. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> I'm in a good position. I'm, I've, I've basically gotten all, I've gotten enough profit out of it to pay. I've just got one little contract left just sitting to wait and see if it'll, if it crashes because I've already gotten enough profit to pay for it. So I have, I have essentially no money at risk, but I just left it there because it, if it, if it drops to a hundred, then I'm golden. If it doesn't, it takes off then. Okay. I'll get out. All right. Let's go see what's happening. Well, that one's working out. So these are I'll give, give me a little a little preview. Um, gosh, sorry, <clears throat> this cough it's irritating. Um, if you don't have Weekly Whispers, this is this is the list that everybody that has a subscription to Weekly Whispers. These twenty eight symbols right here are what they're going to get. Um, it should be out anytime. They usually come out, I think, around nine or ten. It depends on Nick, right? I I record them Thursday night, upload them to the site. And Nick uh, is, I think it's Nick. I don't know. One of the guys on the tech team uploads it and gets it into your account for those that have a subscription to it. So um, you always have the, there's always the free trial. So if you want to jump in that for a couple of weeks, just test it and see how things go. But it's essentially what you get. There's an inverted head and shoulders. And speaking of <clears throat> discretionary, so there's the pattern itself, right? So left shoulder, head, right shoulder. So you can't look at this and say this is head and shoulders. I mean, you could, but you'd be crazy, right? There's a double top. This is not a head and shoulders. There's kind of an inverted head and shoulders, but it's kind of not. The pattern is there, but on a subjective basis, if you look at right here, right? The pattern is there, but it's not in the right space. It's not in the right spot. An inverted head and shoulders typically comes after a downtrend. And this had a downward move but it was after a huge spike. So I wouldn't consider this an inverted head and shoulders. Eh, that's where the subjectivity comes in because yeah, the pattern's there and obviously it played out beautifully actually, but I wouldn't take a lot of risk on it. Now this one right here where we've had a long downtrend for a year or so, and now we have the inverted head and shoulders, this I like, right? So the pattern itself is objective. Now, the question becomes, now we do a little deeper analysis, right? So the surface level is objective. There's a pattern. Now we go to the subjective down to the deeper levels and say, okay, what's down there? Well, what does everything else look like? What do the candlesticks look like? What do, um, what's the volume look like? And it's not really, well, you know what? Let's do that. There we go. We had that big volume bar on the left side. 
kill that. Ah, there, showed up again. So you've had this huge spike of 100 million shares. There we go. So now we found a pattern, right? And there's some solid volume. You look at the green bars down here, pushing this thing north on the left shoulder. That's a good thing that we have an increase in volume. As this thing's trending down, the volume is pretty steady. It's not huge. It's not blowing the doors off anything. You got one big spike here. And then you have a pretty good bullish move coming in with some decent volume spikes there, which adds bullishness to it, right? You're in a downtrend, and boom, now we have the bulls coming in saying, hey, we're excited about this stock at this price. The bears push it down right here into the head, and the volume is about average. Typically, you'd want to see volume getting lighter. Right. So this is a pattern that says we're going higher. So you want bullish volume. If a stock is dropping and the volume is getting lighter, that's actually a bullish indication. That means the bears are less excited. The bears aren't pushing it as hard. There's not as much selling as there was before. So if the volume is getting lighter, that's good. And volume was, it wasn't really getting lighter, but it wasn't increasing either. We got a couple of big bars there with, well, right here at the bottom, which actually is not a bad indication because <clears throat> that could be a spot where people are clearing out. I wouldn't call this capitulation. What you see in market crashes, which is, I think we're getting close to experiencing, the volatility that we're having the last few weeks, usually volatility when it gets crazy is an indication of a top, right? When the market gets really, really volatile, and swinging back and forth a lot. That's typically indicative of a top. That's where the broadening pattern comes from, right? The broadening pattern is a megaphone, some people call it. Whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. A broadening pattern indicates volatility. And if it's at the top of a run or the end of a trend, that's usually an indication that the trend's coming to a close. And it's probably going to turn and go the other way. <clears throat> so volatility typically means reversal. So when you get big volume spikes like this and there's volatility there, that could be an end of the move. And then we get a little run up. The only thing I don't like is we had, you know, we had solid volume running up into bouncing from the left shoulder, but not a whole lot of volume. In fact, it's gotten lighter and lighter as it bounced from the head and then created the neckline. The only other positive thing about this is we've got a significant morning star and a huge volume push, which is news related. Okay, it comes from earnings. Earnings came out the other day. We had a little doji here at the support level 3120, and then boom, it gaps up, created this huge morning doji star. And in my mind, I'm like, you know what? I don't know if this thing's really going to take off to the upside. If the overall market goes north, this thing might. But this morning, it triggered the entry point at 30, 3468. So this is the plan. Right? So if, again, if you're not familiar with my trading style, this is what I do. Essentially, I look at it and go, okay. Here's the inverted head and shoulders. I don't like the slope, the down sloping trend line, because it's really hard to put a stop on it. This is where it's challenging to put a stop no matter what. Because where do you put it? Way down here? And it's going to continue to drop. The, the slope does. So the stop has to be way, way down. It's so far away that your risk reward is completely out of whack. So basically, I looked at it and said, okay, we've hit this spot right here. It's, what's that? It's basically about 34. We hit there, we hit there, and sold off. So we've got this really short-term resistance level. Uh, well, if it breaks north of there, I can see it possibly running up here to the target, right about 38, 38.50. So once I've done the analysis, right? So I find a pattern. That's non-discretionary. That's objective. Here's a pattern. Now we dig deeper. We peel the onion back and figure out, is it a strong pattern? Is it a weak? I'm not super excited about this because the volume, even though we had a good break of the neckline with good volume yesterday, this right shoulder is only based on a few days of trading. Here, this shoulder is based on a few weeks. But here's the challenging part is I've seen, in fact, it was probably a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. There was one, it was, what was the ticker symbol? HIR or something like that. It was some little stock. It was only a 20 or $30 stock. It wasn't huge. And there was a head and shoulders top and it was ugly, 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 ugly. And I'm like, this thing is hideous. I mean, the pattern is there. 
but it's really short. There's this problem. This I see all these issues with this pattern going. It's ugly. But what's funny over the years is that I realized that sometimes those ugly patterns, the ones that aren't perfect, can turn out to be spectacular. And sure enough, this thing, like three or four days later, it broke the neckline and in two or three days, it hit the target. It just went boom. It worked out beautifully and then it bounced. I mean, it, it was, it, it played out exactly as the textbooks say they're supposed to. Even though the criteria was junk as far as quality of pattern, but it played out beautifully. So that's where, and I can't tell you the number of times I've seen that. So I don't look for the perfect pattern, but I try to trade the pattern perfectly. Hey, that just came out. That wasn't bad, huh? <laughs> kind of cheesy, but anyway. Um, so in a case like this where the pattern's there, but once we dig to the, the subjective part and analyze it, it's not spectacular, but that doesn't mean I just kick it to the curb and don't trade it. What I will do is then modify my trade and say, okay, I'm only going to do two contracts or five contracts. I'm going to do a smaller position because I don't like the pattern that much. But if it plays out, I want to be there. That's the scaling part, right? So once you've done your analysis, okay, how much risk do I want to take? Is it worth, you know, a full 10 or 20 contracts? Or is this one to just do five or two? But once you've got that part, as far as analyzing the pattern, then the stop, Again, you put the stop and go where, at what point? In other words, if this thing breaks north of this 34 level, as you've seen it done, and this is this is today's candle. And this is a, there's a 15 minute delay in what it shows, right? So this was 927, so it was 15 minutes ago. So the price 15 minutes ago was 34.95. And you can see it's ticking around. So this is streaming data. It's just got a 15 minute delay to it. But then once the analysis is done, then you say, okay, where will I stop out? If it breaks above this 34, at what point, if it turns back over, do I no longer believe that it's going to run up here and hit the target? And you'll notice that today it dipped down to here. I basically went just below the low of yesterday, or not the low, but the close of yesterday's candle, which is what, 33.54? I didn't mean to put it in a penny below, but it is. Whatever it is. So that's a subjective thing. You've got to figure out, okay, where's the stop? There's the stop. I put the target here at, 3318, it just landed at that spot. Because not only do we have a 530, this is the measured move, right? For head and shoulders, you measure from the head to the neckline. If it breaks out, then that's about what we expected to move. Plus, there's resistance here. The last time we moved up to here, right here, we hit it. Use it as support here. There's more back there, I think, historically. Yeah, support, support, it breaks. Hits it as resistance. There's a beautiful roll reversal right there. Actually, there's a descending triangle. So see that we put a line right here. You got the base descending triangle. It breaks beautifully, rallies back up, taps it, and then rolls over. This is a beautiful textbook descending triangle with a roll reversal. This is the perfect place to enter a trade. That's beautiful. I didn't see that <laughs> until just now. That's what you get if you have patterns of flash. You'll be able to recognize these things. And then you'll understand a roll reversal and why it happens, how to take advantage of it. Because that's 38 to 31. So seven point move in like two or three weeks. That's you're going to get probably a double, maybe a triple on an option trade right there. And it's just a matter of seeing it, right? Recognizing it. But once you recognize it, then you analyze it. So now we've got to stop, we got a target, and then the entry point, it just calculates it, right? Oh, yes, Brenda. Yeah, the, the 22, the 22 moving average on the volume is, uh, it's just simple. Yeah. I think on, I think it says X if it's a, um, yeah, so you see here, it'll say moving average X if it's a, a um, exponential. Just for future reference, so you know. So if you're ever looking at somebody else's charts and it just says moving average, if it doesn't have the X behind it, it's a simple. If it has the X, it's exponential. I don't use very many exponential averages. So, I mean, some people do, some people love them. I don't really, well, here's my style, okay? There's my first template, there's number two. I don't know why it's jumping out like that. I don't look at Stokes very often. I don't look at anything really very. Ooh, look at that. There's the only reason I look at MACD. Y'all see what I see? If not, you need to get in patterns of flash. Shameless plug right there.
You see the lows on the price are getting lower. Ooh, I like to see more. Um, but yeah, the MACD is trending higher. This is the equivalent of, right? If you're in the hospital, God forbid. Um, and they have all the, the, the monitor things hooked up, right? To, to read your internals and all that stuff. And the doctor comes in. And they look at the chart and they're looking at the screen and they're going, mm, yeah, something's not right. You're just sitting there having a conversation. Everything's normal. But they can see that something's going on inside you that you can't see on the outside. And you maybe don't even feel it, but the machine's picking up on it. Right? Yes, that is divergence. So the indicator itself is going the opposite direction of the price. So you've got, you see lower lows on the price and higher lows on MACD. Typically, okay, generally speaking, the price will eventually catch up with what MACD is doing. Right? Now, this is a pretty severe divergence. You don't see it. And that's why it just jumped off the screen. I mean, it was so obvious. It was crazy. There's your exponential moving average, Brenda. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll never forget the first time I saw this was on Juniper and it was in 2000, 2000 or 2001 before the market crash. And it, it had these three peaks going down and the price got higher, but three peaks going down. And three months later, Juniper was cut by like 70%. I remember going, wow, that's crazy. That's about the only thing I use MACD for. So, and I really honestly don't look at them that often. I mean, I entered this trade already <laughs> without even looking at MACD, but now I'm looking at it going, okay, now it gives me a little more confidence in the trade because obviously the internals are getting better, at least based on this. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work out, but it certainly adds one more piece to the analysis puzzle that says, okay, there's, this is looking better, right? Uh, so that's MACD, Bollinger Bands, and this is where, you know, a lot of people use a, and I saw another one the other day, this guy uses a discretionary or non-discretionary system that basically if it closes into the band like it does here, and then the next day it closes above the band, then he enters the, a bullish trade, right? And then exits at the moving average. So buys here, exits right here. Up here, it would be, you know, well, it didn't close into the band. Okay, so here we've got, well, it opened into the band. Let's see if we find one close or maybe it was it hits the band but here's even one that i mean that didn't quite close into it but this one did so then the next the next candle that closes inside the band is where you buy so you buy here and then sell i mean three or four days later up here at the band so these are the types of non-discretionary systems you could set up and have it you know spit it out use a computer to say if it closes into the band, the next day we're going to look at entering long if it closes above it. And then we sell when it hits the moving average. And then you can go back test it, right? If you're if you're a nerd, if you're a quarter of a nerd like me, you're probably not that good at it. If you're a full nerd, piece of cake. If you're half a nerd, you can probably do it pretty easily. I'm not even half. I'm only like a quarter nerd. So, uh, so then there's the moving averages. That's essentially what to look at, but 98% of my decision is right here. The price chart, looking for a pattern. Analyze the pattern. Determine if it's strong or weak. Okay, if I'm going to enter this trade and it moves against me, at what point do I want out? The first calculation is risk. How much am I willing to risk? How much, how much am I willing to lose? If all you look at is how much you can make, then your mindset's not in the right place. I see it all the time. People are like, oh, I can make this much profit. Okay, how much risk do you have? The key to making it in this business long-term is to manage your risk well, is to not blow up your account. You, you, it's capital preservation. The profits will take care of themselves. If you manage your risk well and you manage your stops and you make sure you don't blow up your account by doing anything stupid, then you'll eventually be fine. So focus, the majority of your focus should be on controlling your risk. Setting up a system that says, here's how much risk I have. Here's how much capital I have. Here's how much I'm willing to give to the market to find out if I can get X, right? So that's got to be, uh, that's got to be the most important part is, is managing your risk, risk control. Um, are you talking about Bollinger's? 
Um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I think that was the default on this. On the Bollingers, why 18 and 2 instead of 20 and 2? I thought it was default. Maybe not. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Well, let's do this, Brenda, just for fun. Where is the... We got the upper, put it back on there. That, that's weird. I don't know. It's, it's, bars used in average is usually, this just says, only your bars. It looks like it's automatically calculated. It used to give a, there we go. Yeah, I don't know what that's all about. Honestly, I haven't messed with them for a long time. I don't know what just happened there. That's weird. Let's see if it changes it that much. That's weird. <laughs> Is that better? I don't know what happened. I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the standard might be 20 and 2. I don't think 18 is going to make a big difference. I don't think 2. Two is going to make a huge difference, but you can play with it and see, you know, figure out what works for you is the best thing. So yeah, let's do that. I just noticed you put some symbols. Anybody else have any specific stocks to look at? We'll go look at um, Google. You know what? I'm going to clean this out and we'll just start fresh. So this will, you'll, you'll see then basically how I analyze stuff. And how I set up trades. Set, the setup, setup of the trade is the, the important part. Actually executing the trade is a piece of cake. That's something that should be non-discretionary. It should be something that you just um, follow, right? I think they're basically the same, are they not? Yeah, they're basically the same thing. But the first thing I do is go back and look historically at support and resistance levels. And draw just the major stuff. I'm not looking for every little tiny blip. I think this is probably a more important one at this moment in time, 121. So this is a weekly chart. Go back to daily and see how they kind of land in there. And I'll adjust them a little bit here and there, but just looking for major spots. So the question is, what are we feeling on Google? I don't really see any pattern. I mean, you could stretch this and say that you've got kind of a flag pattern going on. It's certainly not a traditional flag. If this type of thing showed up right here, you got a big old move, right? You got a flagpole. Then you get this type of, you know, two or three weeks of just going sideways. Usually it'd be a little bit tighter. But, you know, you could treat this as a flag. Either way, the resistance there is about 108. In fact, I'd even slide that up for the more, more recent closes right there. I'm going to get rid of these because they really aren't relevant to what's going on here. Even if you call it a flag, it'd be a break of this level that would be critical. So, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that a flag. That's definitely a stretch. So now the question is, do you believe Google's going to hold this resistance and drop off? Or do you think it's going to break out and go north? Let's just go with the analysis to say that this thing might break out and go north. So we're going to plan for that. The question becomes, where do you put your stop? And I used to drop different lines. I used to go like this and go, well, there's the stop. So how volatile is Google? At what point, if it breaks north of this 108, because you can see it's done it. Well, twice it closed above there and then dropped back below. Here it sat right on intraday, it went above it. So if it breaks above here and comes back down, at what point are you no longer confident that it's going to take off, right? And that's obviously subjective. And this is where it's one of the trickier parts of trading is deciding where to put it. And there's no right or wrong answer. The question is how much risk tolerance do you have? But I've just recently found this beautiful advanced trading or advanced um, risk reward thingy. So now I just draw, I go like this. And the first thing I look for is my stop. You see that bottom line there, the one that says stop, obviously. And I'm going to go just below a couple of those shadows. Some of these, some of these days right here, let me zoom way in here. So it's a little bigger. So some of these shadows, maybe even a little bit lower.
So, and again, it's just one of those things you kind of have to just wing it and guess. If you put it super tight, then you obviously risk getting stopped out. Yeah, you're going to have less risk because, you know, if you get stopped out, it might only cost you a hundred bucks where here it might cost 300 or a thousand or 3000, whatever the numbers are. But if you put it too tight, then you also risk getting wiggled out, right? Where it goes down, it taps your stop, and then it turns around. So it's important to look at each stock and say, okay, how volatile is this particular one? How much room does it need to wiggle around during the day? Some people use ATR, average true range, right? You could do that. If you want to use that and add that as an objective data point and say, you know, here's the average true range of this stock. And my resistance is at 107.60, and the average true range is two bucks. Therefore, I need to be two and a quarter away from the resistance level. That would be one thing you could plug in and say, this is what I'm going to use for determining where my stop is. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. You, you, this is the beauty of this business. You can do whatever you want. I think I said that already. But the first thing I do is figure out where my stop is. Now, these other two are not set yet. The green line, which is the target, We'll adjust according to this. So I'm going to grab the entry spot and I'm going to adjust and get the green line up to about where the target is. So the stop is the first thing I drop in, put it where I think it's going to be best. The target, all I had to have to do is drag this. I can drag this. Whoops. That's not what I wanted. I can drag this around and, and have that target land wherever I want it to. But I want it to be right there, basically at 120. Come on. It's a little finicky, but. Close enough. Okay. So then when I drag that, what this is, this, this, cal this basically calculates three to one risk reward. So I have $10 of potential upside, which means I should have about three and a half bucks of risk. Is that right? 109.72 minus 106.30. That's $3.40. Sounds about right. So I've got $3.40 of risk for the potential to make 10 bucks. How many would take that risk? We say I'm willing to I'm willing to risk three dollars and forty two cents for the chance to make ten bucks if it runs and does what I think it may do if it breaks out of this area and it runs to one nineteen one twenty I'm going to make ten dollars. Here's the beauty, and maybe I should have put this in here, but we talked about it last night in trading you. Take risk reward. Okay, take just the numbers on this. Write them down. Take a picture. What do we got to do? Take the numbers on this, 106.31, 109, that's $3.40, $10.23 of profit potential. And go do the math and do, I, I was tempted to do this too today. Take a coin, write down $3.42 risk, $10.32, and do five or 10 or 15 trades. And flip a coin, say, if, if it hits heads, I hit the target and I get a $10.23 profit. If it hits tails, I lose $3.40. So just flip it and watch the numbers play out. Do it 5, 10, 15, 20. The more you do it, the better you'll see it. But when you use three to one risk reward, I mean, if you think about it, just a simple math, and this is what I showed, and I show this all the time. And I asked people, I mean, how many, how many would love, I asked this last night, how many would love to have a 95% success ratio? I got to close with this. Um, right? Everybody would love to have a 95% success, success ratio. First of all, it's, if you're trading directionally, it's virtually impossible on a long, long term period. Short time, yeah. But if those 95 out of 100 trades you make a dollar on, and the five trades you lose on, you lose 100 bucks. That's not good. Yeah, you could brag about being right 95% of the time, but you're still down 405 bucks. No matter how you slice it, you're losing money. The key to trading is probability. It's not about being right. It's about putting the odds on your side. And if you think, if you have $3 of upside and $1 of risk, did my camera go away? I don't know. Anyway, um, if you have $3 of upside and $1 of risk, that's four. If you do four trades, okay, good. It just it usually shows up there. Not that I need to see it, but um, three dollars. Say you make three dollars on one trade and three other trades, you lose a dollar each. You've made three dollars on one, you lost three dollars on three. 
you're one for four. That's only 25%. 25% you break even. So mathematically, anything above 25%, you're making a profit, right? I've never, I just had the idea yesterday or the day before for the coin flipping thing. I've been tempted to do it. That's why I suggest I just hit my brain and reminded myself that, oh yeah, I think it'd be fun to do that. So do it yourself and you'll see and watch what happens with the profit. That's why this system that I use, I find a pattern, I draw the lines, and this is not necessarily a perfect pattern, but if Google breaks out north, I can see it running up to 119. And if you just randomly flip a coin, do this, do this, watch the numbers play out and see how they go. That's why I set up a trading plan like this and I just follow it. I just let it do its thing. Just like EQT, right? I actually kind of like the looks of this right now, as long as the market stays up. But this is one I just threw an order in this morning. I don't know what is going on with this charting thing. There we go. I put a, a, a hook up here. It said at 34.68, go pick me up a small position. And it went and triggered it. So, um, and I'm just going to, and I'll put a stop in here at 33.53. If it continues to run up, I'll move the stop up. I might pull part of it. If it gets halfway to the target, I might pull half of it, a quarter of it. And then I'll adjust the trade as it moves. So it's it's a non-discretionary system with discretionary parts to it, if that makes sense. So, But yes, Kevin, it is. Um, yeah, I don't need the calculator anymore. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. I can just draw. I don't have to, I don't even have to, to punch numbers in. I used to have to go to the mouse, draw the lines, draw the stop, the target, and then go punch it into the calculator and spit out the number. Then I have to go draw the, the entry point. Now I just, well, you saw it on Google. I just draw, whoops, that's not it. It's really, really simple. You just have to draw it in a way that, and you'll have to tweak it. The basic one is, is not there, but I just get the stop landed where it is. And then I grab the entry line and move it to where the, to where the target hits where I want it to be. And then this is automatically calculated three to one. It's super easy. It, it literally saves me like 20 to 30 minutes now. I only analyze charts once a week, right? I, yesterday, I do it Thursdays. And so instead of having to draw one line, then draw another, and then punch it in the calculator, now I just, boom, I draw the setup, and I adjust the other one to where the target is. I'm done in like 20 seconds versus one to two minutes on other ones. So yeah, I love it too. It's amazing. I can't believe I didn't find it earlier. <laughs> now I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all this time I wasted. Oh, how to set a top target entry and, and toss. I don't know if toss has that or not. Is Will here? Will is really familiar with toss, much more than I am. I basically just use the tools that I need. But it would be nice to have that. I mean, I draw lines on there the old school way, like I used to on this. I don't know. I think I looked for that one time to see if they have it in there, but I don't, I don't know if they do. So, But I'm about a little bit over time. Are there any questions? about anything I've talked about here today you need clarity on that maybe isn't hundred percent. You're not hundred percent certain on. I try to I try to be as clear as possible. Sometimes I overkill it. Maybe sometimes I find squirrels. <laughs> um, I know it would be nice if it was on toss because I use toss too. And so instead of having to, to draw it, I, a lot of times I don't even adjust them on there. I just, I, I can see it on this chart. So I look at this chart as reference. And then I'll look at, I mean, I've got this one monitor up here, right? Or it's, I, I can see it in real time and I know where it's at. So I don't necessarily have to have it on both, but it's nice to have it. If it was easy to draw and toss like that, then, uh, then uh, it'd be nice. I might go looking for it now. The question about toss is, is if this drawing tool, uh, this one, right, the, the advanced risk reward, if that kind of tool is available in POS as well. And I, I don't know the answer to that. I should go looking and see. Could always ask too. I mean, ask somebody that, that is in there. Um, spiders. So we're gonna look at the spiders and call it a day. So if you have any questions, get them in there now. Because I'm already over. Pauline's probably like, ah, shut up. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of lines. That's, I think that's based on, I'm gonna get rid of that one. It's been a while since we looked at this, but we were looking at long, long-term picture on spiders. But look at the short-term. Okay, there's weekly. Those lines down there are good. We've got this 4120 level to compete with. We do kind of have a head and shoulders going on, inverted. You know, there's a left shoulder ahead. 
couple of right shoulders. I would call this, consider this more of an ascending triangle, actually, if you draw a line here. No matter what you call it, realistically, if we break out of this 416 level to the north, then what's the next level? It's not that high. Yeah, it's right there at 427. That's the next major spot. You can see how much it hits. This is weekly, right? So you get quite a bit of hits on it. Excuse me. So if you wanted to trade that little range, if it breaks out, you could. This is, I love this thing. I just play with it now. <laughs> just for fun. It goes the opposite way you think, too. You draw down and it goes up. Um, yeah, I would put probably put the stop right about there. And you notice the target's a little too high, so we'll have to come grab the entry and pull it down just a tad bit. But so that there's what there's the plan I would trade if I thought Spider was going higher, if it breaks out of there. And it very well could. Uh, it very well could do that. With the action we have yesterday and today, it looks like it wants to. So the stop at 415.26, you've got eight dollars and seventy cents of upside. So that puts the entry at 418.16, which is three times as much profit as there is risk. So um, yeah, go do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna play with that coin flipping thing. I wonder if there's a digital coin flipping thing. I might do that one one of these days, just for fun, just to see how it works out. So yeah, you and me both, Tammy. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, and there's a lot of stuff. There's there's so much stuff in toss that I have no idea. And I mean most. There's a ton of stuff in Omega charts that is here that I probably am completely unaware of even exists there. So I use what I need, you know, unless, unless there's some need for something else. And I just stumbled off. I was trying to do something with the, I was readjusting my, uh, the drawing tools on the right and left. And I saw this advanced risk reward. I think it's newer because I don't remember seeing it before, but I saw it. And I was like, huh, what's that? I clicked on it and started playing with it. It was like, Ooh. So you'll have to go in and it, it comes out with a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, here's uh, here's what I've got it down to, but you'll have the zero and one. Here, I'll hit restore original. You'll see what you get. So this is what you're going to have. There's a boatload of them on there. And I just deleted all these. I went, because this got Fibonacci ratios. I just did that hit remove, remove, remove. All these extra ones, the negative stuff, just remove, remove them all. There's a Fibonacci ratio. And then make this one four. And then it gives you your, and you can change the color of this one. You can't change these. I wanted, I wanted to make these different color, but they won't stick. I don't know why. But it, it has a stop and label. And then you can show the text labels. You can do all kinds of stuff. Just play with it. Extensions. Uh, play with it and get it to where you want it. Just yesterday, I figured this part out. Where I can have it show the, the profit target. So there's 870 of potential from the entry to the target. So, um, but yeah, that's that. So go play with it and get it, get it to way, the way you like it. Yeah, I love it. I just fall in love with it. So anyway, I got to shut up. I'm rambling too long now. Anyway, hopefully you got all your questions answered. So and again, jump in. You got a two-week trial of Weekly Whispers or Patterns of Flash. You do one. Um, we'll see you next week with the um, Patterns today. I think it's next week or the week after. So, all righty. Y'all have a wonderful day. Um, I don't know yet, Brenda. It sounds like it's hit and miss. So uh, I just found out this morning, actually. I talked to Rob early this morning, and uh, that's why I'll be in the inner circle, so helping him out. So he's got that to deal with. So I will. It's going to be super hot. It's supposed to be like 80 here today, all weekend. It's crazy hot. So I'll, uh, I'll be outside doing yard work. Fun. <laughs> anyway, all right, y'all take care. God bless. Bye-bye.